Is there room for Jesus in your life? We can praise him. We can worship him in a setting like this. But what about every day? Is there room? Have you made room? Getting close to Christmas, isn't it? Comes whether we want it to or not. It's here. I heard about a little lady who, during Christmas week, who had an atheist as her next door neighbor. Uh, every morning during Christmas week, she came out, stood on the front porch, and shouted, Praise the Lord! He is good! His mercy endures forever! Every morning, the atheist next door would shout back, There is no Lord! So this went on every day during Christmas. And uh, about the sixth or seventh day of that week, she comes out, she sees on her porch food of all kinds, bags of groceries, Presents for her family, and she says, God, you are so good. Praise the Lord. Atheist jumps out from behind the bush and said, There is no Lord. I put that stuff on your porch. And she says, Glory to God. My family is blessed, and he used the devil to do it. There's a familiar scripture that we all know, Luke 2. Let's read verses 1 through 7 this morning. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or taxed. This census took place with, while Quirinius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea. To the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Father, I ask that you take this word today, your word, make it live in our hearts. Challenge us. Move in us by your Holy Spirit's presence and power. We'll give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Cheryl, you were only about three, but I was about, I don't know, I was probably seven, six or seven. So you were still kind of a small kid. But my mom and dad, our mom and dad, had taken a church in Lubbock, Texas. And it was a, it was a small church. Had very few people. It was an old building, you know, just kind of a shotgun building. Had a few classrooms attached to it. It was called Bethel Tabernacle. And uh, they eventually changed it to uh, Faith Temple. While we were in that building, though, uh, the church started growing. Now, it was a building that didn't have seats like these. It had pews. But the guys that made the pews, you remember the kind I'm talking about? One befores, all nailed on to some legs they had sawed out. Every once in a while, somebody get a splinter and jump and shout, revival break out. You know, <laughs> it was okay with us. We didn't, we didn't mind. All right. So, <laughs> but I was about, I think I was, I might have been six, but I think I was seven. And so we had enough children, they wanted to do a little children's play. And so the people in the church had created the city of, uh, of uh, Bethlehem. And uh, so I was chosen to be, it was out of cardboard, by the way, out of boxes and stuff, and painted up. And I was chosen to be the innkeeper. I'll never forget it. <laughs> so it came time for my line. Here I am, ready to go. And I opened the little, it was my, my house was this refrigerator box, kind of taller, you know. And they'd cut out a door. And so I opened the door, and I forgot my line. So I went back inside. And you know, we were dressed funny. I don't know if you remember little kids' plays like that. I, I, you know, I think uh, Joanne Fabrics and, and Hobby Lobby love Christmas and Easter because churches buy all that material they can't sell any other time. And I don't know what scholar thought that it's, it's good looking to take a bunch of mixed fabrics and put them together and then put some kind of funny looking thing on your head. Anyway, that's, that's the, kind of the costume I was in. So I stepped back inside the box. I couldn't remember my line. I stepped out and I went, 
I go back in and I close the door. (laughs) You know, you remember these moments vividly. And everybody in the church heard me say, I can't remember my line. (laughs) And some nice lady (laughs) told me what I was supposed to say, whispered the line to me. And uh, I went back through the door. I said, there ain't no room in the inn. (laughs) I don't think ain't was in the script. (laughs) There ain't no room in the inn. Well, I heard from our mother later about that because we didn't say ain't. (laughs) But the crowd got the point. Can you imagine the innkeeper that night? I don't know if he said ain't. He said, there's no room here. No room for the King of Kings. No room for the Lord of Lords. No room for the Messiah. No room for Jesus in the end. Mary and Joseph had just arrived in Bethlehem and needed rest. It was only six miles to Jerusalem from Bethlehem. And all the activities that you read about, how many have ever been to Israel? You've physically been there. It's a wonderful experience. Every Christian should go. Now, we might not should have been surprised about the innkeeper's response because he didn't know them. He didn't know what was happening. Thousands of people making the journey. The inn was full. I understand it. But when we think of it in, in retrospect and we look back on it, we would think that anyone with any clout at all or any pull would be able to get a room. This was the Son of God. Don't you think God could have made some kind of preparation? It seems that God would not have allowed them to stay in a stable. There was just no room, no place. Now, let's not get it all twisted. The inn was not like the chateau or, you know, not glamorous. It wasn't a Ritz-Carlton or five-star hotel. Not that. Actually, just a little guest quarters. And in those days, it was odd to see people come through your town, but this was a mass of people. That day, Bethlehem was probably about a 1,000 people in its entirety, folks who actually lived there. Now they were bombarded. No room in the inn. But they said, you can stay in the stable. We know the story. I got to say, hats off to Mary and Joseph. I mean, they kept a godly attitude. Here she is about to deliver a baby. Think about it. Now, Carol and I have done a lot of traveling. She's never been pregnant while we traveled. Um, they traveled all week. She was tired. Now, if it had been the same situation for us, I mean, I never, I, I, you guys who've traveled, some of you've been traveling evangelists, you get to the hotel and they say, we don't have any room or we don't have your name down or we don't have your reservation. I've been known to get a little ticked. Uh, and so from, uh, I wrote, so I wrote a scripture down this, yesterday from First Irritations 1. It says, so Gary and his pregnant wife, Carol, now that's hard to remember back, isn't it, Carol? (laughs) Traveled all week long, they were exhausted. And when they got there, there was no room in the inn. And that's when Gary went off on the innkeeper. (laughs) You got to be kidding me, brother. Do you have any idea who I am? Do you have any idea who I know and what he's about to do? And then I might say, listen, man. I'm going to remember this. I'm not coming back to your house anymore. I'm not going to knock on your door anymore. And the next time you come to my town and you need a room, you know what I'm going to do, don't you? Yeah, well, I know you think I'm terrible, but uh, don't fool me. You, you won't be any different. I know you. I know who you are. I've seen, I've seen you at the, at the airline uh, counter when the flight was overbooked. You better get me on that plane. I bought this six months ago. I've seen those guys. I know. So I admire Mary and Joseph. Think about it. Young couple. Traveled all that way. Almost 80 miles. Over a few days. I fear today that we're not doing much better as a society to make room for Jesus than the innkeeper did that day. No matter what the situation. I think think we all have to realize 
We should be better at this, for we know who he is. There was no room for the Messiah. He was laid in a manger. I think that's a terrible thing, but, but that must have been the way God wanted it to happen, or he would have made a different arrangement. You think about that for a minute. He wasn't doing it to punish Joseph and Mary. We, we generally view the manger scene small. We've got a couple of them. We've got one back in the office. We've got one out here under the tree. Probably know that a manger is actually a feeding trough for animals. It's, it's where they place this baby was actually a place where animals came by and, you know, had M&Ms or whatever they fed them that day. You know? <laughs> Rough wood made of some hay. We get so busy in Christmas season that we are a little bit like that innkeeper. We, we rush around. We go from store to store, from party to party, from place to place, trying to get the, all the stuff done. And sometimes we just forget the reason for the season. We sometimes even forget the miracle of Christ coming. Shepherds lying in the field, out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks at night. That's what Luke 2, 8 says. Light shone around them. They were terrified. Sure. But the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. It causes great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He's the Messiah. If you go find him, you'll find a baby lying in a manger wrapped. And by the way, there were also wise men there. If you didn't get Thursday night's sermon, it's on CD out there. You need to get it. It's all about the wisdom of God and the wise men. Do you know long before Bethlehem, long before that night, long before the angel's announcement, long before the wise men, long before the shepherds saw the light in the field and the proclamation of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, something supernatural was going on in heaven. You ever wonder what was happening in heaven once the Son of God knew he was going to the earth to become a man. I've mentioned this a couple of times before, but it's worth mentioning again. The Son of God knew that he was going to earth to be crucified. He was going to become the Savior of mankind. But the Bible actually gives an answer. Maybe you wondered about that. How did this happen? How, you know, we don't hear this talked about a lot. We just hear about the event. We don't hear a lot about the process. There's a supernatural declaration in Hebrews 10, 5, 6, and 7 that I'm going to read to you. That you might want to underline in your Bible because this is interesting. It's the Christmas story according to Jesus Christ himself. For this reason, when Christ was about to come into the world, he said to God the Father. Have you ever read that before? Maybe you've read it and never thought about it. When Jesus, the Son of God, was getting ready to descend from heaven to earth, he said to God, you do not want sacrifices and offerings, but you prepared a body for me. This is before it ever happened. This is, this is long before Jesus came and the shepherds spoke the word and the light shone and the star was in the sky. Verse 6 says, you are not pleased with animals burned whole on the altar or with sacrifices to take away sins. Then the Son of God says to the Father, here I am to do your will, O God, just as it is written of me in the book of the law. When he was about to come into the world, verse 5 says, preexistent Christ in heaven. The life of the Lord Jesus did not begin at Bethlehem. He was there before time began. He was there in supernatural form when God said, let us make man in our image. He was there. This Father, this Son, this Holy Spirit. John 8, 58 says, before Abraham was, I am. I am is the continuing sense where there is no time. It is eternal. He did not come into being in Bethlehem, but he did walk into our human history. He always was, he is now, and he always will be eternal God. Christ came into this world knowing his purpose from the beginning. That could not be said of any other baby ever born of human in this earth. Christ knew his destiny from the very beginning. He came to do the will of the Father. He could only do that by becoming one of us. 
He could only become the Savior of mankind by becoming a man. Hebrews 10, verse 8. You do not want sacrifices, offerings, burnt offerings. Hmm. These are sacrifices that Moses' teachings require people to offer. Then Christ simply says, I have come to do what you want. And he did away the sacrifices to obey what God wanted. How many know the prayer that we've been praying for the last couple of years? Not, God, what do you want about me? God, what do you want about my family? God, what do you want about my church? God, what do you want? End of prayer. That's why God said, I will do your will through Jesus Christ. If the will of God was completed, and he did it by sacrificing his body once and for all, for all of us. So the coming Christ, this Christ to be born in Bethlehem is saying here, sacrifices and offerings and practices and traditions are not what God wants. The old plan was not what God wanted. Christ was saying, I'm here to do things your way. When's the last time you've said that to God about your life, about your Christmas, about your Easter, about your family, about your job? I'm here simply to do what you want, God, nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. All the aspects of this Christmas story, there's some amazing truths. First, we learn that God uses adverse circumstances sometimes that make no sense at the time in order to accomplish his purposes for the future. Many of you have been caught in those situations. Many of you may be in that situation right now. where You don't understand the situation you're in. You don't know why you're going through what you're going through, and you can't understand why God hasn't prepared a room for you in the end of your life. And that you've been shunned and turned away and pushed out and, and, and what you thought was going to happen, what you needed to happen wasn't happening at that moment. And you get confused about it. Is God still here? Does he still love me? Is he still with me? First glance, the fact that there was no room in the inn seemed like a bit of an insignificant detail in the larger picture. But it was no small detail to Mary and Joseph. Look. I get calls all the time. Carol and I get letters and emails and calls from folks who are in desperate need. And to some people, your need may seem small. Some people, your need may seem insignificant, but it's not to you, is it? Your diagnosis is not small to you. Your financial situation is not small to you. Your family situation is not small to you. You see, being turned away at the very moment when this baby was coming must have been devastating to them. And giving, giving birth in a stable must have tested their faith in what they had been told to the limit. And it couldn't have made sense to them at this time. They, I'm sure they were, they were devout people and they loved God and they had heard the angels speak, but they still had questions. Why is this happening like it's happening? What is this negative turn of events when we were called to bear the very Son of God, this Messiah. But life's like that. We don't know what's coming around the corner, do we? And, and, and we ought to quit blaming God with a bunch of stuff that He's not responsible for. And then we ought to also be able to accept the things that we know He is responsible for and leading us to a place where He wants us to be where we would never have gone had those events not taken place. Sovereignty of God's an amazing thing. But it's better to rest on what we know about God, that he is good and merciful, and that he does, don't make any mistakes, so he does whatever he pleases. Why? Because he's God and we're not. I'll read that to you, Psalm 115.3, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. You say, well, that sounds pretty arrogant. Well, he's God. He can be arrogant if he wants to. He knows everything. Take great comfort in the fact that our God knows everything. That's the other side of this. Not only does he know everything, he can do anything. He does the impossible. He uses all these things to accomplish his purpose. And that was true for Mary and Joseph. They didn't know the purpose. If I could just know the purpose of God in completeness, how many times have I said to you, God won't show you the end of the road. He'll just give you the light for the next step. And as long as you take that next step into that light, 
there will be another light. But you want to see down there. You want to see the end of it. You want to see all of it. You want to know the mind of God and the purpose of God and the, the, the things that God has already designed and planned. And you want to know it all so then you'll be free to walk. No, he wants you to trust him. And light after light after light proves he's trustworthy. You just step out of that light. You watch what God does. And the longer you're willing to walk in his light, the more light you'll have. And the broader it will get. And the brighter it will become. And the more you will begin to know and see the word and the mind of God come to life in your own life. Nothing's wasted in God's economy. Nothing. Not even being turned away from Mary and Joseph. Not even being turned away uh, at the end. No, it wasn't wasted. Secondly, we learn also that the world had no room for Christ. And today, as I look at the things that are going on around us, it doesn't have much room for Christ right now. In fact, Scripture says in John 1.11, He came to His own, but His own received Him not. He came to the people who should have known him best. He came to people who had studied the scriptures. He came to people who should know that he was the Messiah if they had just put two and two together, but they weren't very good at math, so they didn't do that, and they ridiculed him. They should have known better. They should have known he was coming. They knew the Messiah was coming, but they had a preconceived idea of how it should happen, and how many know that how is none of our business? You've either got to try to know how, or you've got to trust God, but you can't do both. Can't know it all. They had ample warning. If Jesus were born today, it might happen in a ramshackle tenement, maybe in a remote village in India. Who knows where it would happen? Who knows how God would do it if he did it to do, uh, to do the same thing today? But the, they had no room for him in the end then, and the world has no room for him now. Third, third thing we learned that his humiliation started early and continued all the way to the end of his life here on earth. He was born outside because they wouldn't let Mary and Joseph come in. And the whole story is quite remarkable if you, if you look at it. He was an outsider. He continued to be an outsider, born in a stable. Somebody, somebody asked me, I don't know, it was last year, I think, when I preached on Christmas. What do you think that stable smelled like? I said, duh. <laughs> it smelled like a place where you wouldn't want to sleep or eat or have a baby. But that's where Christ was born, the Savior of the world. It wasn't a nice place to be born. It's closer to the truth to say we worship a Savior who was born in a dumpster than it would be to say he was born in a palace, because that would be our qualification today, born, born on, on, at the dump ground, born you know, out in the barn in a farm. And fourth, here's something we need to know, as followers of Jesus. We share in his fate. Yo, whoa. The Bible says we live with him. We suffer with him. We die with him and we reign with him. So what happens to Jesus sooner or later happens to his followers. Are we really ready for that? Is that something we desire? Is that something we want? Just as there was no room for Jesus in the end, there's no room for his followers in the society of the world more and more. Have you noticed that? What used to be something that you wore as a badge as a believer, I'm a Christian. Today you put that on your resume and you'll be shunned in many places. I noticed, I think the last time I was going for some kind of a test at the hospital, there used to be a line, please state your faith. I don't see that line anymore. I don't say that line on any forms. I've only been there a couple of times in the last few years, but I think the last time was when I flew in this building. I told Jess Corsack today, I, I said, now you can fly in this building if you want to. I said, I flew from up there at the top of the choir all the way down here. <laughs> when I fell off that ladder, it was the last time I was the hosp- in the hospital. I'm, I'm at the hospital a lot, but last time I was in the hospital. This week I noticed a detail in the Christmas story that I had always just kind of run through, and you probably have too. There was no room for him in the end. Is that what you said? Is that what we think? No, it says them. I've always thought him. It actually, 2-7 says, because there was no room for them in the end. 
Now, the innkeeper didn't have any idea who the Messiah would be. He had no idea. I'd always read it as there was no room for Jesus. But there was no room for Mary Joseph either. So be careful about being attached to these crazy Christians. You might get shunned too. Every detail tells a story that Jesus and his followers are outsiders. When we try to want to be inside, I was not a very cool kid in school, okay? I was not, I was not accepted much. I was a little bit pudgy. You know, I just, I always felt like an outsider. But I've come to realize that I was more of an outsider because of who I was rather than how I looked or how I didn't always connect with what they were talking about because I came from a different place than most of those guys around me. I came from a home and a family who believed in Jesus. I came from a home and a family who believed in the power of God. I was labeled with those people are full gospel. You see, what happened to Jesus also happens to those who follow him closely. And what we have to understand is there's a price to pay. There's a cost to being a follower, a true follower of Jesus. Mark 8.34 says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. See, when Christ calls us, here's the thing we miss. He bids us to come and die with him. That's not a very happy invitation. <laughs> come on, be a part of my church, die with me. Hey, no, I don't think so. I'm going to find another church that's happy church. And a church that's always, you know, yeah. oh yeah, someday we'll die. But come and live a crucified life with me. Come and live a ridiculed life with me. Come and live a life with me that is filled with power and life. But as far as the world is concerned, it's shunned. I believe it's time for God to remove the cataracts. I told you early this year that God had spoken to my heart that 2019 was a cataract removal year, that God was going to clean some of us up, that he was going to rid the stuff that we've not been able to see off our eyes, and we're going to begin to see the small things. Even the tiniest details turn out to have enormous significance in the plan of God. Sometimes we don't see those. We need supernatural vision, and I believe that's what God is doing, to see hidden things and revelation that's in the word so that our lives become different. God has much more to show us than what we've already seen. God has much more to do in us than what he's already done. But why does God allow things to happen that way? Why not give us the full load right now? Why not just pour it all on me? If we believe in the sovereignty of God, which I do, then we must believe that God did not simply allow his son to be born in a stable, but that God had a hand in creating it that way. There was no room in the inn, dare I say, because God wanted it that way. Let me tell you why. If God had wanted it in some other way, that's the way it would have happened. This was no accident. But why would God want that? See, the no vacancy sign at the inn was there for our benefit. God could have made a room available. He could have created a hospital or a palace. The sequence of events unfolded not accidentally. The census, the long journey, no room at the end, no crib for a bed, no feeding trough, the swaddling clothes, all that. You think God didn't know that was going to happen? So what is God's will for your life? I think Jesus was born that way so we could relate to him. If he'd been born in a palace, a lot of us wouldn't be able to see him as he is. But even the king in the palace can see him now. He came so we could touch him and hold him and he would be real to us because he knew we'd be outsiders too. He knew we wouldn't be perfect either. He knew that we would not have all the, the attributes of the royal family, but we do now. Why? Because he came as a baby in a manger. He came in a dirty, nasty stable. The world has no room for Jesus, but the question is, have you made room for him in your life? Because he's understandable, he's touchable. He, they held him, they touched him when he walked on the shores of Galilee. Even as an infant, being laid in a manger, he became a sinner's friend. Everybody could get to know him. Anybody could come to him. Anybody could walk in. Had he been born in a king's palace, 
all the poor people, all the, those who were not uh, able to go into the king's palace would never have known him. But he became a common man. Come to him, ye that are weary and heavy laden. That's why he was born where he was born. That's why he came to us as he came as that baby in a manger. You who are broken in spirit, you who are bowed down in soul, those who despise yourselves, come to Jesus. He's been where you are. He's understood what you've never understood. And I pray that we have a revelation today of what God is, who he is. It's time to say, yes, Lord Jesus, I'll make room for you in my heart. It's time to say, Lord, I, I'm sorry that I have not given you more of myself. Lord, I'm sorry that, that I have done things my way. Lord, I'm sorry that I haven't made more of a place in my heart. Come on, Dean. Make room today. Making room is what's important. Giving Jesus a place. Allowing him to have the place that he deserves. He came as a baby in a manger so that we could lift him up into a place of preeminence. He truly is the King of kings and the Lord of lords.